Hello and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Now, today's episode focuses on postnatal depletion and the consequences of it. And before you think this doesn't relate to you, be you man or woman, then pause, look down. If you have a belly button and if you've gone through birth, then this is relevant to you. Okay, and another point to get your attention, we've all had a mother. We know, we may know a mother, we may even be a mother. Well, stay tuned. This is, as I said, a really important show. My guest today is Dr. Oscar Saralach. Now, Oscar is a general medical practitioner and has for many years dedicated, uh, been dedicated to remaining at the cutting edge of wellness healthcare. His dedication led him down the path of studying and practicing functional medicine while addressing the multifactorial aspects of health and well-being. He's been on the board and served as the editor for the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine for many years and frequently presents for the college. Oscar is well known in the field of postnatal health. Through personal family experience, he actually has three young children, a great learning experience for any practitioner, but also through the lens of functional integrative medicine, he came to realize the huge impact that nutritional, environmental and lifestyle have on postnatal, on the postnatal period, a period we have all been through. And the impact of it is, as you will hear, huge. Oscar brings his knowledge of postnatal depletion and the fourth trimester, which traditionally has been thought of to last for only a few months, but it really lasts for well, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not, I won't spoil it. I'm going to leave it to, uh, to the to Oscar to pass that one on. His book, The Postnatal Depletion Cure, is fabulous, and he has also created a unique working environment, working exclusively with a highly skilled and diverse team at the Health Lodge in Byron Bay, North and New South Wales. I hope you enjoyed this conversation I had with Dr. Oscar Saralach. Welcome to the show, Oscar. Uh, thanks, uh, Ron. It's great to be here. Looking forward to having our discussion today. Oscar, you know, I sat and listened to your uh, presentation at a recent course that we were both on, Postnatal Depletion, um, and, uh, and there's so many questions I wanted to ask you. Uh, but I wondered if you might just share with us, because I know you're working up in, a, in in Byron Bay in northern New South Wales, and, and you've got this amazing facility called the Health Lodge. And, and I think uh, it's actually, I, I, when I heard about it, I thought, gee, every health practitioner would be envious of this. Can you share with us a bit about your journey and segueing into the Health Lodge? Tell us about it. Yeah, so um, I come from a, an emergency medicine sort of background and sort of moved into the world of a sort of general practice. And one of the things I know about general practice is uh, you're often just working by yourself in a silo. You know, from an emergency department, you're working in a team, those kind of things. And I kind of realized pretty quickly that after my training in GP, that wasn't really going to work for me as a, uh ongoing sort of career. And I was, I was very interested in nutritional medicine, I'd grown up with homeopathy, um, and so it was quite an easy transition into uh, le learning integrated medicine, and uh, I spent the next you know, five years after finishing my GP training just going to every uh, acronym course that I could sort of get my hands on and just really uh, had an amazing journey with um, just, just learning about this much broader aspect of, of lifestyle and nutrition and environmental sort of medicine. Just to share with our listener, that acronym, uh, ACNEM, is the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine, of which you are, you and I are both proud members. Go on. And you're a very important part of that, Ron. So, Thank um, you, Oscar. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and so, um, and, you know, you get to meet great people uh, when you're sort of asking the right questions and going to the right sort of events. And I met Ren Dubois, who's a naturopath in Byron, who had this vision to sort of start up uh, essentially a 21st century model around sort of healthcare. And so we set up the Health Lodge uh, over four years ago. And you know, the vision around sort of the Health Lodge is really around a different delivery of sort of healthcare, um, uh, where we try to put the patient at the center of the equation, not the doctor. 
Um, and so this is the idea of you know doctor centric versus patient centric, and it's a very you know when you kind of look at it at its core, it's a very different way to sort of approach things. You know this idea of um, if you've got a problem, you have to ring you know, a medical centre, you have to get an appointment, you have to kind of wait, you go to the waiting room with sometimes you know, sick people, and then you know, you've got a very short period of time to plead your case to the doctor. They don't even know why you're there. They're sometimes running late. There's, you know, it's kind of a high-stress environment. Um, and a lot of people don't represent themselves very well in that sort of short period. I mean, it's when you kind of look at the medical model in that way, it's... Uh, it's really disadvantageous to the client. And, uh, and then so our idea of, well, what if you put the patient in the center of the equation, that if the doctor doesn't turn up for work, the patient's still getting care, whereas in the old model, if the doctor's not there, there's no kind of care going on. And so, and so that was uh, the vision, I suppose. And you know, there are many people doing great work in Australia and overseas and uh, the Health Lodge uh, was a kind of refurbished backpackers, essentially. And so it's got facilities for people to come and stay. Mm-hmm. So we have five rooms for people who want to do long health retreats, for example, who can actually stay on site um, and, and kind of receive you know, care during the day. Uh, we've got uh, a, a yoga shower in the, in, in the complex. We've got... Um, uh, many sort of rooms with different types of practitioners, everything from traditional Chinese medicine to naturopathy to uh, psychology. We've got visiting specialists coming in, a psychiatrist, a, a gynecologist, uh, and we really pride ourselves on working as a team. And we have these amazing uh, twice-a-week team meetings where everyone comes together and contributes. And, and for me, that's a special source of what we do. Uh, we have people coming, uh, sitting in on these meetings and just uh, going, wow, I've never seen anything like that before. And and for me, that's a real learning time. I, I, I offer my wisdom to the meeting and the, the meeting often, you know, will often reflect back um, their wisdom. And, and so it's a really uh, interesting sort of common ground, if you like, for everyone to come together and talk about uh, clients, um, obviously with their permission uh, and and, and, and just having a different perspective. And, I, and I've learned sometimes incredible things where the osteopath might offer something that I had no idea about. Mm-hmm. Um, or Amazing. the psychologist is giving you an insight into their story that you're going, well, look, I was just looking at their, their physical symptoms and their pathology and not realizing sort of the, how their story is a very big part of maybe why they're not able to get better. Mm-hmm. And, and there are many examples around that, but it's just, it's, it's a, for me, it's a real privilege to be sort of uh, part of this. Uh, everyone who works here really enjoys that sort of model. And then the fact that people can actually stay here uh, is very interesting. When you actually have people living in your clinic almost, mm. um, kind of gives a different perspective on things in terms of uh, what's happening on the ground rather than people kind of presenting themselves nicely and then coming to their appointment and, and you kind of, uh, you, know, you can lose a lot of valuable information just in, in that. Um, mm. And, you know, we're still working hard and trying to better the model. Uh, you know, we're far from perfect. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're very hindered by things like software and even patient expectation. Even though people want to be moving to a patient-centric model, people aren't really quite fully ready for it either. Mm. Well, people have to be ready to engage. I mean, the other model that you mentioned about a practitioner-centred approach is very much the practitioner, you know, patients surrendering care to their practitioner. And uh, it takes a sort of a psychological leap, not just for the practitioner to engage in a patient-centred approach, but if it's patient-centred, the patient has to be engaged as well. Well, they have to be engaged, they have to be enrolled, and they actually have to be the CEO of the project mm. model that's mm. going on. And they have to be doing the work in between appointments and, and really turning up in quite a different, in a very active way rather than what you're alluding to is quite a passive way when you're you know, handing over your uh, power, as it were, to the practitioner that you're kind of seeing and going, well, just tell me what to do. Mm. And, the thing I, that... and, I, and I might do it. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing also from the practitioner perspective, because healthcare is pretty stressful and being in um, in a busy practice where the appointments are 7, 10 or 15 minutes, which is typical of a lot of medical practices, it's a very stressful environment and isolating environment to work in. So I can just imagine what this two uh, meetings a week thing would be so therapeutic and not apart from the learning experience of bringing all these different disciplines together the impact that it has on each individual's psychological well-being would be really really important yeah well we're like a family and it's just those meetings are almost like a tuning uh, event where if each practitioner is like a different string on an instrument we just kind of it's, it's a time where we can actually tune together and kind of remind ourselves of our goals and kind of what the common conversation is around. And I think that uh, is, is very healthy for everyone. I and mean, we can't afford to be isolated and stressed when we're trying to do the healthcare. I mean, it's kind of a, a, a bizarre paradox, really. Mm-hmm. Now, you've written this book, The Postnatal Depletion. and Postnatal Depletion uh, Cure. Yeah. The pro- say it again, Postnatal Depletion <laughs> Cure. Yes, I got the whole hole there, but but um, I wonder before we leaped into that, we might I might ask you where where are we at in terms of pregnancies and births and mothers' response to this phenomenon, which we've all been part of. Um, so just I'm not too sure exactly how to what that where that question is kind of going wrong, but um, you know, part of my journey with. Uh, you know, learning environmental medicine was you know, I was starting a family at that time, mm. and I'd come back from a conference and I'd be learning about hormones or about copper or about you know uh, um, environmental toxicities, and I was kind of realizing there was a very exaggerated thing going on for mothers uh, that they had a lot of these kind of issues, but they, there's something very unique about them too, and uh, and so you know, part of my journey was realizing that there isn't a lot of medical science around uh, the postnatal period. There's heaps around pregnancy and antenatal care. Uh, and I think we've medicalized pregnancy, which is an unfortunate thing because it's actually a transformational experience that mothers are going through in terms of uh, changes to their brain, their hormonal system, um, and their uh, uh, social IQ. A lot of these things kind of get this upgrade during pregnancy, and then we need to support mothers in that transition to uh, into motherhood, and uh, mothers are obviously very uh, important. Uh, you know, my, my joke that we we're sort of talking about before is, you know, this idea of mother care is only relevant to people with a belly button. Um, you know, we all, all have a mother, and we all, all involved with mothers, and, and you know, the mothers have been the centre of our communities and societies for a long time, and we don't honour them in, in a way that we sort of used to. And there's, you know, there's a very sort of unique uh, biochemistry, psychology uh, that's going on during that time. So m- my book, The Postnatal Depletion Cure, was sort of born out of my journey with acne, born out of my uh, um, uh, just working with mothers and my own sort of personal journey with my partner and having three kids and just seeing how mothers can really suffer uh, in that postnatal period. It's not just in the first few months either. It can be in the years afterwards. And there, uh, there was a, uh, a, a kind of a moment for me when uh, an Australian study came out in 2014 that showed that the peak incidence of post of depression postnatally was four to five years after the birth of a child. Wow. But they couldn't call it postnatal depression because the definition ha- is it has to be within the first six months. <laughs> So I was like, oh, my God, we've got the definite. This is why we're not seeing things because uh, we're kind of so locked into a way of looking at postnatal yeah. that we can't even do the stretch to have a look at what's going on beyond that. And um, and so you know, I really like this term matrescence because it kind mm. of combines yeah. this idea of pregnancy, the postnatal period, and beyond. Uh, it's a term that came out of anthropology, moved into psychology, now starting to work, work its way into the world of biological sciences. But it's like adolescence. It's the becoming of an adult for adolescence. Matrescence is the becoming of a mother. Uh, I believe matrescence is more biologically uh, significant than adolescence. Uh, it's a pretty big call, but when you have a look at the brain changes 
um, you know, there's more neurogenesis occurring during a pregnancy than there is during an entire adolescent time. So the more neurons being laid down. Uh, and so the brain gets this massive upgrade during pregnancy. For the mother. For the mother, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we only go through adolescence once. A mother goes through matrices every time she's sort of pregnant. Mm. Um, and, again, we support adolescents through their transformation because we know it's not an easy time and they've got to get used to their new body and their new brain and and hopefully they become a, a really good adult at the end of that. We need to be doing a very similar thing with mothers. And a mother's is a learned skill. It's not something that you sort of get a divine download during your labour. Um, mothers, you know, it's a learned skill. We need to support mothers through that transition into matrescence just like we do with adolescents and Mm. we have a really uh well happy adjusted sort of person at the end of that so Mm. i I think i think it's very interesting that you should say this term was born out of anthropology Mm. because um you know culturally over the hundreds of thousands and probably millions of years but let's say over hundreds of thousands of years our tribe would have prepared us for this process of uh pregnancy, birth, and beyond. And so interesting that it's come out of anthropology because it's where we may be seeing so many of our problems because that kind of support, that kind of cultural support is just not there. Well, exactly. And a big part of my journey was um, uh, you know, when I was seeing these struggles that mothers were happening, having, I just went to the library and I went online and I started going, well, where are the textbooks? Mm, mm. Um, and there were you know, a few studies on postpartum fatigue. You know, there was some, there was very little out there in the scientific space. And I kept, all my search terms kept on bringing me back to things called postpartum practices, which uh, are, are these old cultures and anthropological sort of research. Um, and at first, I was a little bit annoyed by that, just going, "Oh, come on! I, I want the science. Of, you know, not not you know, what we we're doing tens of thousands of years ago." Um, but then I realised that there was a similarity between these cultures. I, I, I think I've collected about 90 different postpartum practices from different cultures, and they all have a time of deep rest, of honouring the mother, of that that she doesn't have to engage in her role back into society for often four to six weeks, sometimes a bit longer, and then she's expected to turn up in a, quite a different way but is really supported in that transition. And what I've come to realize is that time of deep rest for four to six weeks typically is a hormonal recovery time for mothers. So they can reset their hormonal system rather than staying in this very low hormonal state for months and possibly years after the birth of a child. And all that comes with that in terms of mental health issues, hypervigilance, physical health problems, sleep disturbance, weight gain, and the list is long. And it's just been, all these things have been very much normalised because they're common. But um, just like diabetes in Australia, 50% of adults uh, 50 years or above have diabetes. Um, half of them don't know, but it's so common that it's, 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 uh, it's been you know, normalised in our mm-hmm. society. You can't say that having diabetes is, is normal. And so for me, having postpartum fatigue and uh, a lot of these, you know, depression, anxiety, uh, the mood disorders, uh, weight gain and things you know, postnatally are not, they may be very common, but you can't tell me that they're normal if you understand you know, the physiology of what's uh, going on, what should be going on. Mm, wow. And, and uh, well, what are some, I mean, you've mentioned those challenges and I guess, it's a bit like uh, building. I guess the one thing is to build resilience prior to the pregnancy. Prepare, yes. prepare. Tell us, tell us how. Take us on the journey. I mean, if you were uh, writing an ideal, you know, a, a guide, which you've done, <laughs> uh, I'm sure you've covered this. And you know, well, tell us how. How? Let's start from before we lob into the problems. What would be an ideal way of preparing for pregnancy? Yeah, that's a great question. This is where I really like to go to eventually because it's like servicing your car uh, regularly to avoid a catastrophe on the highway Mm. rather than just having the tow truck number and and that's kind of your your plan. And a lot of us have this tow truck kind of mentality and don't 
aren't even aware of the preventative stuff. Um, and so ideally, you know, I'd, I'd not like to see mothers get into this, you know, postnatal neuroinflammatory state that is depletion. Um, and so a big part of it for me is understanding a woman's own physiology. So that's a really nice. So it's not every woman's obviously very different. And part of that is understanding what foods are good for you and what foods aren't, these idea of inflammogens. Just because one person, you know, corn or gluten uh, is an inflammagen for them, it may not be for someone else. And so it's this kind of a journey of just looking at what foods uh, agree with you and what foods don't. Really understanding uh, your individual sleep needs. I think you know, we live in a society where sleep is ex expendable, and that's you know, a, a real starting point for getting depletion and fatigue postnatally if you're not having good sleep leading into things. A really big thing that I do, especially with my pregnant mothers, is learn how to relax. You know, it, it sounds almost ridiculous. No, no, it sounds so aspirational for us um, all. But you know, when you know, you're six months in with a newborn and it's three o'clock in the morning and you haven't slept in months and your child's not sleeping and has got reflux, that's not the time to start learning how to relax. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so, and again, that relaxation may look different uh, for each sort of person, but a lot of it's around having a practice. And so the practice might be a meditation, it might be uh, a yoga class, it might even just having hobbies that are very, uh, you know, um, that provide a deep flow state. So, you know, like you know, some people find knitting or reading or, uh, you know, a lot of these things are actually really good for our nervous system and hormonal system, which are actually helping reset the, uh, our stress system. Uh, we kind of let a road over time, or we never, never actually learn what's kind of good for us. And we get annoyed by meditation because, you know, we find it hard and so we kind of leave it. Um, and, and we don't do hammock time very well. So when we are, it's a figurative term, not literally in the hammock, but in the hammock and we're meant to be relaxing, we're often on social media, we're kind of busy thinking about things and we don't actually switch off. And so this idea of stress on, stress off, stress on, stress off, which is actually a really healthy mechanism. We actually do really well with stress on, stress off. Uh, because life is so busy, the 24 7 uh, rush, we just stress on, stress on, stress on. And so, a big part of either conception work or during pregnancy is how do we engage the stress off button? What does it look like for you? And let's start practicing it. Um, because, like I said, you know, when you're deep in postnatal despair and struggling and you're depleted as all hell, um, that's not. It's a very challenging time to start learning these kind of things. So, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so the, the pre work is a lot around that. And then we'll do testing to have a look at how nutritional state, are there any sort of signs of food inflammation, uh, how are your hormones kind of looking, uh, and really about where someone's inflammatory state is at. Because pregnancy is a controlled inflammatory state. We know all the problems associated with pregnancy, whether it be premature labor, whether it be a preeclampsia, hypertension, gestational diabetes, those are pro-inflammatory states. And then postnatal depletion is definitely a inflammatory state, as is depression, as is uh, OCD and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And those conditions postnatally are very different to uh, uh, um, prenatal depression, anxiety, OCD, uh, because inflammation often isn't involved in those sort of states. So if we can at least have a – and inflammation isn't necessarily a bad thing. You need inflammation to be able to grow the placenta and grow the baby, and uh, but it has to be controlled. Uh, it's a bit like a bank balance. You know, you need enough money coming in, enough bills being paid and, and just staying in the black, and, and, and everything's kind of good. When you go into the red – or when you're already in the red from an inflammatory point of view going into a pregnancy, it's going to make things a lot harder moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, and moving on to the birth, because obviously the births are pretty, uh, it's exciting time. Uh, we think about the baby that's being delivered, but there's a placenta attached to that, isn't there? And and yeah. actually, I, I heard you speak of it, and I heard you give a brief history of the birthday cake, <laughs> and and I wondered if you might just share a little bit about the placenta and the birthday cake story with our listener. Yeah, for sure. And I'm totally fascinated with placenta, and it's an organ mm. you know, that 
grows inside the mother, but it belongs to the baby. Uh, humans have had to revert to quite an ancient type of placenta to enable enough fat to pass the placenta to make the baby's brain. When we're, we're big brained, uh, uh, obviously, and, and human infants are born way more prematurely than other apes and other mammals. And if you looked at a goat or pig placenta, it wouldn't quite work to deliver enough fat to the baby's brain. So we've, no, interestingly, we've reverted to a more primitive type that allows much more fat to cross the placenta, but that uh, is more prone to damage and to placental dysfunction. Um, and the placenta serves two masters. You know, both have to serve the the mother and the child. Uh, the placenta, the first thing the placenta does is actually put a hold on the mother's stress response system because if it didn't, you know, it should pretty quickly reject this thing that's 50% foreign, the baby and the placenta, and then it kind of produces 200 different hormones and marinates the mother in hormones. Um, and wow. this is where a lot of the brain changes come from. You know, estrogen, for example, goes up 30 times above baseline in the third trimester. It goes up a 1,000 times above baseline in the days leading up to a birth. Wow. Now, progesterone 10 times, cortisol 3 times above baseline in the third trimester. So there's so much cortisol, the stress hormone, um, that if you or I had that amount of cortisol in our system, we would be totally freaking out and not able to manage but the placenta is kind of you know, doing a beautiful sort of juggle. And not only is the baby born at the time of birth, uh, also the placenta is born. And so the mother loses this hormonal factory, mm. it loses control on her stress response system, and then she's meant to start producing these her own hormones and start re-engaging her upgraded stress response system. So this kind of nature's plan, and this is why we have ideally you know, four to six weeks of deep rest. Uh, ideally. Yeah, to allow that to kind of happen. And this, and this is why it's been an imperative amongst old cultures. You know, it's not just a nice, fanciful, you know, mythological kind of idea. It's like if we don't do this, you know, mm. we don't just, you know, go into this kind of strange world of hypervigilance, anxiety, and um, uh, poor energy which is what postnatal depletion is uh, essentially about. And then you know, there, there are a couple of leading theories around the origins of the birthday cake, but the leading one is that it's the birthday cake shaped like a placenta. We honour it every year at the birth of that, that particular person, mm. uh, and we uh, cut it up and, to, and share it and eat it. And so um, it's – and so what – uh, historians think is that it's actually a placental honoring ceremony that we do every year, not only to honor the person, but to honor what brought them into the world, the placenta. Um, unfortunately, it's become just a sugar fest in the 21st century. Yeah, which is adding to the cortisol and stress levels <laughs> and neuroinflammation. It's almost a cons – anyway, if you had a conspiracy theory – um, yeah. We won't we won't go there, but but was it anthropologically were, were cult, did cultures consume this uh, the placenta? I mean that's something I've heard about. You know, well, it's, called, it's called placenta phagy. Um, I am not, and I've done a lot mm. of research. So I'm not aware of any ancient culture that will eat the placenta. Mm. Mm. I'm relieved to hear that. Um, uh, even though it's a very common uh, thing that's done nowadays to encapsulate the placenta and. Um, and then I have a lot of clients saying that they have felt much better on the pregnancies where that happened than not. So I'm not going to get in the way mm -hmm. of that. It's a very contentious issue on a number of different uh, areas. But uh, for me, I just tell mothers they need to honor the placenta, whatever mm. that looks like to them. If eating yeah. it is honoring that, that's fine, and burying it under a tree. But all, so many cultures have placental honouring uh, every year. And for me, you, know, you can never look at it, the birthday cake the same after you know No, it. I was just going to say I'm never going to look at it. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to look for an interesting recipe which in some way reflects that. Okay. It could be okay. an interesting challenge. could be another book there, uh, Oscar, a follow-up book. <laughs> <laughs> the, the placenta. And it's something that, you know, it's, it's a very uh, more and more has been written about it, but it's, it's just something good to have a conversation around and, if you have a look at a, you know, a traditional birthday cake that doesn't have too much fancy stuff on it, it looks like a placenta. Mm, mm, mm. It's brown, yep. kind of got 
cracks in the icing, which you know can seem to look like that. Um, okay. Yeah, so, um, so, so part of this issue is the definition of of well, part of this issue is not that deep rest hormone, you know, uh, honouring the mother, giving them four to six weeks to recover, given yeah. this incredible hormonal change which has occurred. Yeah. Um, but it's also the fact that we've restricted this to a six-month thing, and after that, it's a it comes under a different category. What do we do? What 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 can people do when they're faced w- with these issues? Because the issues are all of the things you've mentioned: putting on weight, mental health issues, poor sleep. Da, da. What what, are, what what? How should we approach this? What is the postnatal depletion cure? Well, I mean, the idea is that this, we need to have a broader definition. So I've said, well, hey, maybe the definition of postnatal should be seven years, mm-hmm. um, not six months. Um, and there's quite a, a lot of research showing that the postnatal period or the effects of the postnatal period, you know, whether it be depression peaking at four to five years after the birth of the child, uh, the, the Danish postpartum thyroiditis study is showing that the incidence of thyroiditis related to the birth of a child peaks at about a year after the birth of a child. Wow! Because so, 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 so okay. after the birth, the, the people are more susceptible to thyroid uh, problems, and that's yeah. an epidemic in our in our. I mean, thyroid. It, it is, and I, I believe that you know, autoimmune diseases can be very much kicked off by, uh, especially a stressful pregnancy, a stressful labour. But there's very little actual epidemiological research that's done on autoimmune disease. So, um, and the thyroiditis study from Denmark is the only one that I can find that's actually followed up nearly half a million women over many years. Mm. They're looking not only at autoimmune disease but also thyroiditis and other um, thyroid conditions. And that's just looking into the room through a keyhole just going, wow, there's something big going on here. Now, so many of my mothers who have autoimmune disease or rheumatological conditions, you know, when they come back from the immunologist or the rheumatologist, I say to them, did they actually ask you whether you, you had any children? And, and nine times out of ten, it's like, no, they didn't. Well, it was such a short appointment, we didn't even get there. Mm-hmm. And I say to them, did you actually tell them that this started pretty quickly after the birth of a child? And they're like, well, no, they didn't ask me. Mm. And so the, the specialists who should be known aren't answering the question, and and so it's a blind spot. Mm. So you know, I've come up with a term um, called matriatrix to kind of go, well, look, maybe we should be having a separate field of medicine to not only to acknowledge the fact that mothers are not maidens, so you know, women who haven't had children, and they're certainly not men, um, and you know, we all kind of know that is it. And it's not too far a grasp to, but they're pretty much lumped into uh, men's you know, studies and issues unless it has to do with the reproductive system. Mm, mm. Uh, and, and medicine doesn't have a very you know, clean origin in, in that regard that you know, most studies up until the 1970s and 80s were done purely in men mm. unless it had to do with or contraceptive pool or reproductive you know, carcinomas or those kind of things. Um, and reluctantly, women was, were, were added into research you know, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and you know, I look at that and just go, it's kind of ridiculous. It's 50% of the population. Mm. Um, we all know that we're not the same. Um, and I certainly know mothers aren't the same as maidens. Mm. Uh, and we and certainly know that men are much simpler physiologically than than women, not to mention mentally. And one could go into this. We won't. We won't go down that path. But but I guess the women, you know, God, they run. They have their periods every. You know, it doesn't even come every month. It could be variable. So how could you include them in a study? No, no, we'll we'll remove that lot. <laughs> well, it's, and that's what's happening. Yeah. We joke at medical school about the mythical seventy kg white middle class. Uh, Caucasian male that was kind of galloping out there in, in 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 society somewhere because that's where most of the research that we were looking at was based on this kind of mythical creature, um, and you know, it wasn't you know, a lot of research wasn't taking into fact even cultural diversity and those kind of things. A lot of the research from America now is showing that uh, Afro Americans are, are very different in a lot of their risk factors and outcomes and, and those kind of things. And a lot of research now is showing that cardiovascular issues in women 
uh, present very differently. They uh, and probably need a different treatment to this strategy. Uh, and, and and that's not even looking whether they're mothers or not. So yeah. it's uh, mm. I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by that. So so matriatrics is kind of a term I've come up to with just to kind of maybe warm the discussion around maybe we should have a separate. This one goes pediatrics and geriatrics yeah. to uh, have a different sort of focus and. Um, hopefully, I see that in my lifetime that we yeah. do start to have. But, but there's, um, I mean, you know, uh, women choose not to have children or to have children, or sometimes they don't choose. But the fact is, some women do have children and some women don't have children, and that experience physiologically, apart from anything else, is is very different. puts them into a very different women's health, gyne- you know, gynecological experience. Is that, that's what you're really saying here, isn't it? Well, yeah, and it can really affect, you know, the menstrual cycle after children. It can really affect how their menopause is going to be. There's probably effects on autoimmune disease, inflammatory disorders, you know, osteoporosis, I suspect, might be you know, put in there. But, again, you know, there, the studies, because mm. being a mother is pretty common and possibly more common than not being a mother, it's, it's, it's almost considered to be a normal part of, womanhood if you like whereas um it, it's uh it, it needs its its own sort of filter and, and uh acknowledgement and way of kind of looking at things so hmm. um, now another uh, thing oscar that you mentioned and I, and I wanted to ask you a bit about is the this uh, hormone leptin because we hear an awful lot about insulin and yep. we are very preoccupied, quite rightly so, I guess. Uh, but but leptin's one that we don't hear a lot about, or as much as we should. I wondered if you might share with us, give us a little bit of leptin 101 and, and why sure. it's so significant. Yeah, so I'm fascinated with the leptin. And uh, a lot of what I know about leptin I actually came from doing research in chronic fatigue uh, and then kind of realising in my mother's is... Uh, uh, a separate issue going on around something called leptin resistance mm-hmm. that causes a neuroinflammatory issue, and that's kind of inflammation within a very specific part of the brain. Um, and you know, the brain is obviously you know, the air traffic controller of the body, and so if you have inflammation in very specific parts of the brain, they have downstream effects, exaggerated responses. Um, and you know, the body can get blocked into inflammatory states. And so what's interesting about leptin is it was only discovered in 1994. So it's fairly recent. Mm. The first 10 years, researchers had it all upside down, and they, you know, they, there was a, a billions of dollars thrown at trying to find a leptin analog because they found in these agouti mice that they uh, had no leptin and they were obese. And so they were like, okay, well, if we can maybe – give leptin and they gave leptin to the mice and they kind of became normal weight and so they were like great this is like insulin um no and when insulin was first discovered it was mainly around type 1 diabetes where there was no insulin and you had diabetes but that's the less common issue with insulin and it's actually type 2 diabetes it's a bigger common which is actually insulin resistance so actually too much insulin is produced in the body to become resistant to the signal and so when they came to do human studies in the early 2000s, they realized that, hang on, most humans have too much leptin and not zero leptin are obese. And so they discovered this thing called leptin resistance. Um, the pharmaceutical industry dropped it like a hot potato, just going, well, no, that's... No, we, there's we nothing here. Well, there's not an instant money-making drug to be had with, you know, with, with these leptin analogs that they've discovered. And they kind of... Uh, but what's interesting with when... Uh, if you have a condition like postnatal depletion, so a neuroinflammatory disorder, it can really affect the leptin signal. Leptin is produced by the fat cells to tell the brain how much weight uh, 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 is the body carrying. I mean, how does the brain actually know? The brain doesn't just look at your, your, your waistline and go, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm overweight or I'm normal weight or I'm, I'm skinny. And that, that's not how the brain receives its signals. It's not a visual signal, it's a, it's a biochemical signal. And leptin is that signal to tell the brain how much weight are we carrying. Um, and when we eat a fatty meal, you know, leptin is produced by the fat cells and it's part of the, with ghrelin is, is another uh, hormone that kind of is about uh, satiety, so feeling full. Um, so we don't sort of overeat and we don't sort of undereat. 
But what happens with leptin resistance, you know, leptin, I'm totally fascinated with leptin because, you know, there's still so much we don't know about it. There are six different receptor types in the body. So it's, it's like, um, for me, leptin is almost like uh, a vowel in the alphabet. You know, just because you've got the letter A doesn't mean that A works the same in every word. Mm. Um, and leptin you know, has, has a different effect in the liver than it does in the gut, as it does in the brain. Uh, and, and the brain is a very unique way of processing leptin. But if you have sleep deprivation, as an example, or if you've got um, you know, some sort of toxicity that might be coming from envir- the environment and that starts setting up a neuroinflammatory disorder, you know, mold is probably a very common neuroinflammatory disorder where you see leptin resistance, the brain starts to become insensitive to the leptin signal. So the fat cells start to produce more leptin and you develop leptin resistance. And um, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but what I say to my clients is leptin resistance is like your brain thinking you are super skinny. Mm. And, And if you're overweight and your brain is thinking that you're super skinny, you have to kind of go past the irony that every decision that your body makes thereafter is with that decision in mind. So exercise and um, counting calories, if your brain is thinking that you're super skinny, isn't going to work. And this is part of the paradox that a lot of, uh, especially females with leptin resistance, and I mean can get it uh, as well, um, uh, that their brain gets tricked into thinking that they're very skinny. And when they exercise, they become stronger. Now, they might, but they'll burn muscle before they'll burn fat, mm. typically. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's a very tricky world of mathematics to go. And when you're looking at that sort of 20th century calories in, calories out, burn off your calories through exercise, and that's the end of the conversation. Um, that's certainly what I learned in medical school, uh, and we uh, we know that it's not like that now. And so many clients, you know, tell me, "Look, I've done the calorie counting, I've done the exercise, I actually gain weight." And my my GP tells me I'm kind of crazy or I'm cheating or and and uh, so you know, we often will look and let them. Is that the explanation of what's going on? And then what do you do about leptin resistance? Because it's not like, oh, here's a tablet or a pharmaceutical that's going to correct that. Um, a lot of what corrects leptin resistance is lifestyle. So getting um, – so two most powerful things for leptin resistance are correction of the circadian rhythm. Mm, yes. And, and that's... Re- because that's one of the causes of leptin resistance. Yep. Um, so getting up at the same time every day, going to bed at the same time every day, getting enough sleep – making sleep a priority, uh, and then eating at similar times of the day. And the other thing that can be profound for re- reversing leptin resistance is restricted eating hours. So this whole thing around the 16-8, uh, so fasting for 16 hours a day and only eating for eight hours a day, I think a lot of the benefit of that is through leptin correction. Um, now, there are other things you know, that it does which are also very important. So... And we're not designed to be eating from dusk till dawn necessarily. Mm-hmm. It's a, it, look, you've mentioned two things there that are just a recurring theme on so many discussions I'm having recently, and that is this circadian rhythm and this yeah. time restricted eating. And, you know, you can only reflect back on um, the advice that we've been given via the food pyramid or the food plate or the Australian Healthy Eating Guidelines, which suggests three meals a day and two snacks to keep our blood sugar levels up, is a beautiful economic model. It's great. It keeps the food industry and pharmaceutical industry busy for yonks, but it's just not happening. It's not having very good effects on our health. And the influence on our circadian rhythms of our lifestyle is another another big one. That that's it. and and the other thing that strikes me is we very rarely test for leptin, do we? In blood tests, I can't recall ever having been tested. Is there value in blood tests for leptin resistance? How do you determine leptin resistance? Um, well, technically, you're meant to do a fasting leptin level with a uh, leptin receptor byproduct sort of ratio. It's, it's almost impossible to do. I've never done it. I wouldn't know where you'd get that done. That's kind of research only. Okay. But all the researchers who do this 
say a fasting leptin is a good enough test. Okay. Um, it's not a cheap test. It's not paid for by Medicare. Um, you know, there's one lab in Sydney that does it um, in, in Australia, and there's often a, you know, a four to six week uh, wait time for that. Mm. So sometimes I'll make the assumption that someone may have leptin resistance um, or order the test uh, and start treating it, waiting for the result to come. Some people need, I think, just the confirmation. I think it's, it's very useful from that point of view. Um, at the moment, you know, for me to get a leptin test, it's about $160. So I don't sort of go there lightly when I'm sort of ticking boxes for pathology, but I definitely walk someone through that. Uh, and how necessary it is, mm. uh, but it's you know, it's uh, and, and so that's you know I've, I've done uh, 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 I'm, so I'm quite familiar with doing sort of the fasting leptin test and its utility, uh, but I, I think even if it's just an explanation of what's going on or or to help someone commit to doing one of these things around circadian rhythm and restricted eating hours amongst other things um you know i think there's great utility in that mm. engaging someone in, in their health journey is really important so the explanation part of that is actually really important rather than just i've got this idea um and let's uh, uh, start treating it so um the idea in the testing confirming uh, your hypothesis and then go to start doing these sort of corrective uh, behaviours. Now, another thing that I heard you speak of and I was fascinated by, and I may not get the pronunciation of this correct either, microchimerism. Yeah, so uh, fetal microchimerism. Fetal, fetal uh, microchimerisms. Okay, is that correct? That's the way we say chimerism. Yeah, tell, so, us, tell us about it. So chimera is a, is a Greek god that is part lion part human i think so this idea of being half half where the word chimera comes from um and i think uh and so what happens uh during a pregnancy is part of the child's or the fetal cells or the, the, the cells from the baby make it into the mother's circulation and that's called microchimerism and a small amount is considered to be normal and it's some researchers are even thinking that there may be a benefit from that. Um, it somehow tunes the mother's body. These cells can stay in the mother's system, usually in the bone marrow, for up to 20 years beyond mm. the birth of the child. Wow. Um, and sometimes uh, a child will have some of the mother's cells in their bone marrow. So it's, it's possible for a mother to have her mother's cells in her system and the child's cells. Now, when the placenta becomes too inflamed, so we talked about inflammation, and becomes slightly leakier than it should do, you get more cells getting into the uh, mother's circulation, and this actually might be a unhealthy stress on her immune system. And there are quite a few researchers who are saying that they think that they may be a contributing cause to autoimmune disease, for example, postnatally. Uh, a um, number of researchers looking at you know, finding male DNA in the thyroids of mothers who have thyroid problems. And where does that male DNA come from? It's either come from a male child, um, and it might have come from a blood transfusion, um, you know, they don't think it can come from intercourse, uh, but you know, that Y DNA, uh, which is what makes makes it male, has come from somewhere. Mm. Uh, and I'm amazed that this isn't talked more widely about mm. in medicine because this is, everything is is kind of more in the research field, and nothing I've seen is in the medical sort of field. Uh, it's a very interesting idea, if nothing else, and it's a very profound idea. Going well. If, if this is meant to happen, and you know, nature's obviously not stupid, uh, you know, there's a positive aspect to it, but like many things, when it, it gets, becomes exaggerated, then there can be a negative aspect to it. Um, and I don't even know what you'd do around trying to reduce mother's you know, uh, fetal cells in her circulation, but we should, and, uh, we should just try to provide an environment where that's not happening, where the placenta isn't too stressed. And, and, and it's behaving you know, appropriately. 
Mm, amazing, amazing! What a what an interesting thought. You know, one of the things also that I find um, uh, very interested in, and we touched on it earlier, is um, that uh, cultures prepare for for pregnancy, etc. What what are some of the things that, in your research, we can learn from our traditional cultures? Yeah, and then this goes from you know, North American. <clears throat> cultures to Asian cultures to African cultures to old European cultures um, and so you know for me in, in a nutshell it's about uh, really preparing the mother for the postnatal period you know the, the birth of a child is not the finish line like I was kind of certainly when uh, through my parental journey it's the start line. You know? Yeah, just once we have the child, our lives can get back to normal. Oh, wow, yeah. what a lesson that's learned for all parents. Yeah, yeah. I, I <laughs> wish I hadn't had that kind of uh, idea in my head with, with having children just going, yep, yeah, yeah, our child's just going to become part of our lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's a very harsh lesson to sort of go through, especially you know, in the middle of you know, sleep deprivation and struggle. Hmm. And so I really encourage people to uh, you've got a, you've got a birth plan, fantastic, that's great. Put it away. Let's get a really good postnatal plan, mm -hmm. and yep. let's empower not just the mother, but ideally the father or other caregiver to in, to initiate that plan and be. Uh, no, the mother shouldn't be running around making sure people are doing the food roster and. You know, doing washing rosters and, and those kind of things. You know, that, that should be the caregivers, other caregivers you know, role. Having food turn up, people kind of doing cleaning in the house and, 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 and so the mother and ideally the father or other caregiver can really be in that deep space for that four to six weeks. So you know postnatal plan is around providing the cocoon, if you like, around the baby bubble and, and trying to get the father or other caregiver as much involved as possible uh, rather than having them busy running around doing stuff or at, back at work. Uh, so that's one thing I've really borrowed from old cultures in that postnatal plan. Uh, interestingly, all universally all old cultures have only cooked food, often fatty food, um, and there are special prepared food, foods for mothers. And they often happen to be high in fish fat. Uh, you know, there's no raw food typically. Lots of broth, slow cooked foods, um, regardless of the time of year, and just things that are very easy to digest that are nutrient dense. So that's kind of. Uh, and so if you're doing a food roster, uh, and I love the idea of a food roster where you get people kind of engaged to bring food to your house, they can say hello to the baby and then they can take the garbage out or no, no, uh, be doing other things. You know, we, we had a joke in my clinic that in the first six weeks, uh, oh, uh, no visitors, only staff. <laughs> and the idea is that if anyone's coming to have a, a nosy at the baby, you know, you're not, you're not being entertained. You know, they're there to do a job mm. as, as well as, you know, uh, visit the family. So, and... Uh, and just to give permission, I mean, in our culture, you know, people need permission to do things some, uh, a lot of the time. And part of that permission is going, you can uh, take six weeks off from your busy life and just dive into this and switch off social media and not really engage with society. And that's okay. And that's actually part of the biological design um, rather than just uh, – uh, getting this idea of trying to get back to your maiden itself, back to work as soon as possible, pretend like you're not a mother. I mean, this is part of the mantra of the 21st century workplace, mm. uh, which everyone loses when that's you know, the, the common conversation. You know, pretend you're not a mother. It's like, that's just crazy. And so breastfeeding at work is kind of part of that, not in, not really engaging uh or engaging in a very different way to after-school activities, those kind of things. Now, in Denmark, they have, if you're a parent, you get six extra days of paid holiday by your employer that are called parent days, that you can do something with your child, like if they've got a school performance. The school performance isn't going to typically happen outside of work hours, 
or there may be a school exertion, uh, excursion that you want to go on or you know, maybe a camp that they're doing. Mm. Uh, you can actually go, do that, be paid, and not pretend that you're still at work if you sneak away to, to do these sort of things. And it's a, it's a very interesting conversation that when I talk to people about that, they're just like, wow, I have no, I have nowhere to put that. Um, <laughs> what, do we, what do we also learn from traditional cultures about timing between children? Because given this enormous impact on the woman's body, hormonally, physically, mentally, emotionally, I'm guessing that uh, recovery, and we're talking about postnatal period being seven years, well, very few women would leave seven years between. What do we know about from traditional cultures about timing of other children? Um, well, what we know about traditional cultures is that they have children much younger, mm-hmm. so often in their late teens, early 20s, so they're, they're more uh, immune to the effects of sleep deprivation, for example. This is why we can, we can party in our 20s and go to work the next day, no problem. Much harder to do that in your 40s. Um, so there's, there's, there's that biological aspect to it. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of research around the time between children, but they tend to leave two to three years typically. Other apes, three to five years between offspring um, is is what the researchers are saying. And for me, that's a very common question that I get at my sort of public talks, uh, probably the most common question that I get actually, uh, what's the perfect time between children? And for me, it's not a number. It's the fact that you have to have your sleep uh, re-established and re-established for more than just a couple of months. Mm. Mm. So if you have sleep deprivation, sleep debt, and sleep disturbance going into your next pregnancy, you're setting yourself up for a much harder uh, next round of pregnancy and postnatal. Um, but you know, I'm really interested to have a, a you know a conversation around that uh, because I don't know the answer. Specifically, but what I've worked out is that the sleep is a really crucial part of going into your next pregnancy healthy. We're having twins more often, so I think the rate of twins is about one in eighty in sort of uh, pre IVF times, and now you know, that rate's probably double, maybe more. And so that has a huge biological impact. And then we have this kind of very cerebral kind of idea around, oh yeah, I want my children pretty close together, and no, we're going to be moving into this world of designer babies very soon. If I want a boy, girl, boy, or no, whatever. Kind of, <laughs> scary, you know, scary. It is yeah. scary. And again, none of that's really born out of biological mm. Mm. Um, uh, planning, really. It's just more out of this, this cultural conversation that we're having. Yeah. Well, Oscar, you know, your book, uh, Postnatal Depletion Cure covers a, a huge uh, range of these issues and more in, in much more depth, obviously. And so we're going to have links, obviously, to that. Well, I just want to finish up and ask you this. Uh, taking a step back from your role as a doctor, because uh, um, we're all on this health journey through life in our modern world, what do you think the biggest challenge is for people, for us, on our journey through life in this in this world we live in? Um, That's a great question, and uh, I've got a couple of things that are coming up for me around that. So, um, no, I think one of it is permission to do things that are good for us that may not necessarily be part of the two-dimensional life goal, money earning, house building um, that I certainly sort of grew up with, Mm -hmm. and it's a very common part of this hollow capitalistic drive that we sort of have. Um, so, And a lot of people really struggle to give themselves permission to relax or get a massage or do nothing. Mm-hmm. And lie in a hammock and do nothing. I mean, I look at the, the new generation of you know, teenagers and young adults and you know, they've grown up with technology. You know, the, the idea of that is, is quite foreign to them. Um, and if they have a spare moment, they're on social media or on their phone or playing a video game or watching YouTube. And so there's, there's not even – so the permission to do this isn't there or the idea that that should be done. Um, and part of that is we need to give ourselves permission and also the, uh, the priority to really engage in healthy practices. 
this idea of a practice. Uh, I talk to all my mums and all my clients around. You now, practice is something that we do ideally every day or quite regularly. It's not necessarily outcome driven. So, you know, um, try, trying to do uh, training for a marathon and you're trying to get some sort of, uh, you know, a kilometer under five minutes or whatever your goal is, you know, that's not a great example of a practice. Uh, and it has to help reset the nervous system. And when you look at what uh, the blue zones, you know, these, the oldest of peoples in the world, when you have a look at people who report um, happiness, so the people who are happiest in the world, you know, they're people who do have a practice, who are in a flow state frequently, who are really kind of engaged in their society outside of themselves. Um, and we live in such a me, me, me kind of world that we just don't really think in we and you know, doing things that you don't necessarily want to do but are good for our local community. And we, we're, we just we've lost connection with those kind of things. So practices can sometimes be around those sorts of things. Um, and looking at something bigger than ourselves. And, and sort of it's quite a long-winded way <laughs> to get around to your question, but essentially – We've lost you know, when you believe that you are the biggest thing on the planet, you're going to run into a lot of problems. And we need to really believe in something bigger than ourselves. And it doesn't have to be a religious idea of bigger than me, it can just be an idea of maybe Mother Nature or community well being, something bigger than me. We actually are a lot happier when we do that. Um, all the research is kind of showing that it's, uh, when you're the biggest thing in the room. You're going to suffer <laughs> um, eventually, and uh, and we live in a world where we aspire to that. Um, uh, so, yes, I think the biggest challenge is around giving permission to be able to relax in a healthy way, stress on, stress off, and then to aspire to belong to something that's kind of bigger than ourselves, and that. That, that's a really hard challenge if you're not familiar with that. I, I talk to my kids. I talk to my kids' friends. You know, it, it's not part of their conversation. You know, they're going to have to learn this um, you know, probably the hard way in terms of just experiencing crisis, asking big questions, and then you know, um, going through a transformative experience. Mm. Oscar, what a note to finish on. Um, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your wisdom and your experience. I've really enjoyed the conversation. We'll obviously have links to the book, but also uh, the Health Lodge as well, which is just such a wonderful enterprise. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Ron. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for everything that you do. You're a, a leading light in the wellness community. So the thanks is going back to you. Oh, thanks, Oscar. Well, we'll have links to Oscar's practice website, The Health Lodge, and his book, The Postnatal Depletion Cure. It's fabulous. It's really worth a read. Don't forget to download the Unstress app at the App Store or Google Play and keep up to date with the episodes, the blogs, the courses and events as they happen. 2020 is shaping up to be a very exciting year for us and we want to share it with you. And of course, don't forget, leave a review on iTunes. So... Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriate